You know, you look at this picture, and it's just amazing. This was the golden era of jazz. That photo was the pinnacle of jazz in the 50s. There are all these guys, these famous jazz musicians. Count Basie, Sonny Rollins, Horace Silver, Dizzy Gillespie, Gene Cooper, Jerry Mulligan, Lester Young, Charles Mingus. Thelonious Monk and Coleman Hawkins. That's a good combination, Monk and, and Hawk. And then there's these uh, two women. But who are they? I think anybody knows. There is nothing like the joy of playing music. My name is Clara Bryant. I'm a trumpetiste. Oh yes, it's always, always a surprise to have girl musicians. I'm Viola Smith. I'm a drummer. There were no women with any of the big bands. I was the first one as far as I know. My name is Billy Rogers and I played the trumpet. I played with the greatest female band ever, ever. Hi, I'm Rosalind Perron, and I play alto sax, clarinet, and flute. Well, if you don't feel it, forget it, because you can't play jazz unless you feel it in here. My name is Peggy Gilbert, and I play saxophone. I knew I was going to play the trumpet. My mother played piano, and my father played violin. My mother played the greatest old ragtime jazz piano you'd ever want to hear. Every one of us had to be, just think of nothing about music, music. We used to sit by the Atwater Kent radio and listen to the music coming out of the hotels around Boston. My dad would take us to the dances, and stand outside the, the dance hall with me on his shoulder, and I would look through the window and see the, the trumpet players, and they would be playing the trumpet, you know, and do what, do what, do what, do what, and I, I like that. And my father wanted me to find the sound that I liked, and that's what I would learn to play. So we listened, and one night I said, oh, I like that, and that was the saxophone. <laughs> I started to play saxophone when I was a senior in high school. They didn't have many girls on instruments. They were violins, harpists, pianists. When I was about nine, we started a family band with mother on piano and dad on his instruments, my older brother on his, and I, I did the vocals and played my trumpet. They wanted me to play violin. Well, I'm kind of lazy. I said, no, I don't feel like holding a, a violin on my shoulder all day long. I want to play something else. He said, well, what do you want to play? I said, I'd like to play trombone. I'd like to see that slide go up and down. I was one of eight sisters in the family orchestra. I happened to be the sixth one in the family. It was time for a drum to be added. So I was very fortunate. It was the easiest thing in the world, and rather than play an instrument all night long like the rest of the girls had to do. In high school, I wanted to get to the football games, and I thought that was a good, a good way to do it, so I joined. And they said, how about this? Do you want to play this? And I said, oh, okay, what is it? <laughs> it was a trombone. I never ever saw another girl do what I did. I was in my 20s before I even saw any, another girl play a trumpet. I saw women saxophone players once when I was about 11 or 12 years old. My dad read in the paper that at the Metropolitan Theater where they had vaudeville, they had a new act 
And because they played the saxophone, he probably thought I would really get a kick out of this. There were the Siamese twins joined at the back, all the time on roller skates, playing the saxophone. This is a picture I've never forgotten in my entire life. When I was coming up, it was way, way back in the vaudeville era. I had an eight-piece girl band. I was the band leader. And in those days, there were little or no girl musicians. There was Phil Fatale and uh, a couple of big bands that people today never heard of. It was difficult for the individual musicians to get booked by the male bands. That was just a, an unwritten law that they wouldn't hire the women. When I was substituting for a man one time, and they called me and asked me if I could jump in, I said, certainly. So I did, and the leader wanted to keep me, and all the men in the band got together and talked the leader out of it because he said, we don't want a girl around. We can't talk the way we want to talk, and we can't do things we want to do, and we just don't want girl musicians, and besides, they can't play very well. put a bunch of musicians behind a curtain, and who's gonna tell me who the, who's the female playing or who's the male playing? You can't do that. The music is the thing. That's the important thing. Piano players, yes. Basses, maybe. Guitar, maybe. But uh, mostly piano. They would not, when you put the horn up to your lip or in your mouth, that was it they would not call you. I knew then I had to get a girl band because there was no chance otherwise. And I had many wonderful musicians to work with out here. The place was loaded with them. There were a lot of girl bands. Ina Ray Hutton, Sweethearts of Rhythm, Ada Leonard. Kumba, 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 Jero. Kumba, 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 Jero. Leonard I worked with on TV for a year at the same time that Ina Ray Hutton was at another studio. And uh, so I just played with those bands until I got the lay of the land and knew what was going on. Many of the brilliant stars of stage, screen, and radio are graduates of the Broadway nightclubs. One of the most glamorous of these is that pretty little spitfire of syncopation Ina Ray Hutton. They had to have something new, dancing do up there in Harlem, so someone started trucking. As soon as the news got round, folks downtown came up to Harlem, so everybody trucking. Ina had really good arrangers, always. She admired Ellington and Basie, and we had good musicians, and it was a good band. 
remembers me playing in front of the Anuray band. She had great rhythm and knew what she wanted, but she was not a musician. There was nothing that she could play. But she was a great dancer. She was really a good dancer. this band that we allowed us to go and play uh, at the different fraternities and sorority dances for blacks in those days, you know. Pontywood School uh, was a place for underprivileged black children. They got a better education. Mr. Jones saw Phil's Fatalities group on there. He says, well, I have enough uh, girls here that play instruments. Why don't I start a girls uh, band too? Mr. Jones had uh, some Mexican girls that, you know, he, he let come to Pontywood to go to school. We also had a Chinese girl there. And so one of the uh, people that worked there said, she said, so why don't you call it the International Sweethearts of Rhythm? Because you got different nationalities. And that's how we got the name International Sweethearts of Rhythm. Anna Mae Winburn, who was the uh, director of the band, she was like a front for the orchestra the band. She looked great all the time. I had a male band in Omaha, Nebraska, called Anna Mae Winburn and her Cotton Club Boys. Then here come the sweethearts to Omaha. And I said, oh, gee, aren't they cute? You know, <laughs> that's beautiful little innocent girls, you know. So they said, um, Ray Lee Jones wants somebody to direct the sweethearts to rhythm. I said, gee, I don't know whether I can get along with that many women or not. Anna Mae Winburn was like a mother figure to us. She helped us in meeting the public, mainly keeping away from the men. And in fact, the matter, she taught us the facts of life. I knew Mary Lou Williams very well. She was a wonderful human being, and I admired her because she was one of the best players. Her style covered from ragtime to bebop uh, and beyond that. I mean, she was with the Andy Kurtz band, and that was a fine band of that, that period. And she r arranged for them, she played for them. She was marvelous. By the time Mary Lou is 15 and 16, she's a consummate professional. She's playing with some of the top bands of that time, McKinney's Cotton Pickers, which was one of the top groups to come out of that Midwest experience. When Mary Lou comes into the whole Andy Kirk organization, she's caught between two worlds in many ways, because Mary Lou has come out of this black urban experience that is rooted very much in this Southern vernacular culture and she moves to this Midwest environment where the concepts of racial consciousness are very different for blacks. So you get someone like Andy Kirk, whose aspirations were to be the black guy Lombardo. He didn't want to be stigmatized and marginalized in the way that black bands were being at that time. He wanted to do the full range of big band music. Without Mary Lou's arrangements and without Mary Lou kind of serving as the engine of the rhythm section, Andy Kirk's sound would not have moved outside of those regional circles of the Midwest. She was literally the lady who swung the band. She's the lady who swings the, she's the lady who swings the band. She's the lady who swings the band. My junior year in high school is when they got a, a they brought in the new innovations with the bands and the marching band and the swing band. So that was the way I started. My band director had gone to college with a man who was teaching band at Prairie View College. 
and they had an all-girl band, and he needed a trumpet player. So that's where I went. And here's a great picture of me taken in a hotel room. This was a publicity thing. When I was playing trombone, Tommy Dorsey was it. And then I met him. I had a one-nighter with Tommy Dorsey. How about that? Not the best I ever had. <laughs> it was an, an exciting time, but you always had that one thing to confront you. The agent would come up to me and say, we can't use that girl. She's, uh, you got to get somebody that looks better. And don't forget to smile at the women. How could you smile with a horn in your mouth? I did get a call from the Ada Leonard Orchestra, which was rehearsing and going to open at the Oriental Theater in Chicago. And I said, yes, yes, and I was so, so excited. After some rehearsals that week, we were shown our costume. And out comes this god-awful pink thing with flounces, and, and it had all these flares and, and pink ruffles, and I was mortified. I'm a professional. <laughs> I wear a skirt and a sweater and a, or a blouse, a white blouse with a little black tie. I don't wear pink ruffles. And I, I hated that gown with a passion. Females were not looked on in the same, with the same attitude, shall we use the word attitude, as male musicians were. Well, most of them treated us as novelties. It was unusual, and people thought it was cute, you know. On our first show, when the curtain went up, the audience went insane. They were clapping and stomping and carrying on and whistling. We hadn't really played much. <laughs> We'd only played a couple of notes. And so after it died down and then an act came on, I sort of whispered to the girl next to me, why the big reception? And she told me, well, Ada was a striptease artist. Well, I thought that was hilarious. We all had to have long hair, and we could not be seen with saddle shoes. To be wearing saddle shoes meant that we must be, must be gay. Men's bands always wore the same uniforms. The guys can have white hair and glasses and weigh 300 pounds, but if they can play, great. The girls, they want to look like a bunch of young starlets. And the things that they put on us were unbelievable. I played for a short time with Georgie Graham's big band, and he was playing in New York when he heard about the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And the manager, Mrs. Rayleigh Jones, asked if he knew of a saxophone player, and so he thought of me immediately, and he called me up. He introduced me to Mrs. Jones on the phone, and, and she did mention that it was a, a colored big band, and uh, would I have any problems? No problems. I told my mom and dad, and uh, I didn't ask them. I more or less told them. <laughs> they knew I was chomping at the bit. I just had to go back on the road. I walked in, and there was everybody in the band getting ready for the night's gig. And I was going to wear a, a skirt and a white blouse and a jacket. And there was this magnificent brass section behind me and rhythm section, and I just knew I, had, I was in the right place. It 
it was a lot of fun. The fun lasted until we started doing one-nighters uh, in the South. Anna Mae mentioned something to the effect that we're going to Jim Crow country. I'd been in the South with Ada Leonard. Nobody had mentioned this man's name. And of course, I had never met him. So I guess I'm going to meet him now. And then I learned that Jim Crow was a set of laws that was set up to keep black people as far removed from whites as it's humanly possible. They wouldn't stand for us mixing. I was dying to get hold of a girl one time that was a trumpet player, and she was just great. And I wanted to put her in the band, you know. And they said, we can't do it because there are a lot of people that would object to a mixed racial band. I feel so lonesome. I don't know what to do. Well, traveling to the South is something you really would like to forget. Some of the experiences you had, you know, like we'd pull into a service station and the guy would come out with his gun and say, we don't, we don't have any black toilets. You niggas go out in the field and squat. The band had its own bus, upper and lower berths like a Pullman car. And that was our home on wheels. Had a little bathroom in the back. There was a great danger for the band, for everybody in the band, for our bus driver. We all found it was much easier if I just stayed in very dangerous places in the bus. And I also remember some places they would accept you, some places didn't have room for you, you know. We didn't sleep on the bus, we wouldn't have a place to stay. We played theaters, we played dance halls. If we were in a theater, the white folks would be downstairs and the ropes would be dividing the blacks and the whites. Everything was segregated, everything. There could be no fraternization between the races. The problems of traveling in the South were the same for male bands as they were for female bands. But the women had it a lot rougher just because they were women. There were always a group of women who would open their homes to traveling musicians, and they were saints. There was never a question that I couldn't stay in their homes, even though it was putting them in grave danger, real jeopardy. There were times on bandstands when it became pretty tricky because I was right there in the front row playing alto, there was no way to hide my face. Well, in those days, there were a lot of bedroom integration. And there were a lot of black girls that had white parents, you know what I mean? See, so they were so, yeah, I'm black. Uh, my mother's my mother's black. You want to sit? And they said, no, we don't want to go see your mother. We want to know, you know, what nationality you are, you know. Mrs. Jones thought that possibly they, the girls could come up with a way to either darken my skin or make it a, a shade that that, that uh, would be not be off-putting to sheriffs who were sniffing around trying to determine whether I was white or not. Uh, and we tried different uh, face powders, and it really, it, it I just turned orange for the most part. See, we had so many mixed girls in the band. The police came, you know, and he says to my uh, my husband's manager at that time, he says, "You have white girls in this band." And my husband said, well, if you can pick out the one that's white, then you arrest him. And the one that he picked out was the mulatto. You know, <laughs> he never did pick out the white ones, you know. Yes, I feel so lonesome. Soon we're heading back to the Williams house for sweet potato pie. We get lots of hugs from Mrs. Williams and a bag of food for each of us. As we climb aboard the bus, she calls, bye, chillin'. You all take care of each other and we'll pray to the good Lord to look after you. I reach out through the open bus window, grab Mrs. Williams' hand and say, I know how much courage it took for you to take me into your home and I will never forget you. And I've not forgotten. Oops. Those were rough days. Rough times. Scary times. 
I was surrounded by the girls with so much love. And then so many times I felt so embarrassed for my race, so humiliated by them. I wanted to lash out at them. And of course I couldn't. Well, why don't you and the girls warm up with a jam session? Okay, so it's me. Let's take it, girl. The white world was completely unaware of us. Not only we were told, but we knew that we were the best, but we couldn't get that point across because we couldn't play the places that we wanted to play. I played with the Ada Leonard band one show, and then after that, the next day, they said the studio had gotten all these calls. This TV show that was doing real good, they, they had gotten calls to get the nigger off the show. But I didn't have a solo, but they didn't want me up there on the band. That was a hurting thing. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. When the war came along and all the men were gone, practically the musicians were scarce to find then, I got a lot of work. We have a right to be proud of the part that American women are playing in this war. We found that the hand that rocks the cradle can build bombers, make ammunition, can turn every kitchen into a salvage station for vitally needed war materials. There is a job for each and every one of us, and it is our duty to find that job. I remember during the war, there were a lot of girl musicians with the male bands. Billy Rogers was with Woody Herman. In 1941, I headed down toward California, and some friends of mine had, a, had put a band together three other gals out at a club in Culver City. In a very short period of time, we were practically packing the joint every night. One night, uh, Woody Herman's road manager came into the club and he invited me over to his table for a drink during intermission and told me that Woody was looking for some kind of a special attraction to take on the road with him when they headed east. Arrangements were made for me to go to the recording studio and audition in front of Woody and the band. I just sang a couple of songs and played my horn, and Woody hired me. Surprise, Woody hired me. <laughs> We're playing ballrooms and theaters and everything. On my left are the Sweethearts of Rhythm, one of America's top all girl bands, directed by Anna Mae Winburn. Jack, they are ready. Are you ready, girls? Yeah! The black servicemen heard us all over the Far East and uh, Europe, and they were so excited about hearing a black female band that they wanted us, they just bombarded the USO. We played a lot of USO camps for the armed service. We got to La Havre, France. We played the Olympia Theater in Paris. Then we went on for five and a half months. We drove through snow and rain and what have you. And we met the most wonderful men, white and black. That's when we discovered quartermasters. They really outfitted us. They gave us long johns, underwear, uh, mittens, and wool caps, everything we needed to get through a German winter. We played all the military bases, but when we played Tuskegee, we played for the Tuskegee Airmen. And they had just become selected as the ones who would escort the white flyers in Italy. It had rained. And so we couldn't walk in the mud, you know, and with these high heel shoes and stuff like that. 
So we had to be picked up by these guys. And <laughs> I'd never been in, in, in a man's arm. I, oh, my goodness. I can't explain to you how it felt. That felt so good. <laughs> it was the most exciting time ever, ever. I felt like a sweetheart. I joined USO, and everybody was saying, oh, you're going to love working with the Americans. And I did. That's where I met my husband, Jimmy McPartland. <laughs> 